इकबाल शिकवा लिख के इस्लाम जिंदा कर गया मरने वाला मर गया इस्लाम जिंदा कर गया दिस वॉज नाइनटीन थर्टी सेवन आई वॉज अलेवन ईयर्स टाइम शी आई थॉट दैट आई वॉज टू मच ऑफ अ प्ले बॉय आई डोंट नो शी चेंज हर माइंड एंड शी सेट ऑल राइट आई फर गिव हिम टूडे इट्स अ प्ले टू हैव अ कॉन्वर्सेशन विद सैयद बाबर अली अ नेम विच इज मच बेगर दैन द कैनवस ऑफ लाइफ बाबर साहब टेल मी योर फादर सैयद मरातब अली साहब एंड योर अंकल सैयद एहसन अली साहब they both started from a very modest and simple beginning in early 1900 in anarkali in a, from a small shop what was special in those two gentlemen that made them successful in next 20 years that they were one of the best businessmen in that era when there were very few muslims in the in business community i think uh, the credit goes to their father which is my grandfather sayed wazir ali who um, started his business in Ferozpur in 1875 and uh, my uncle and my father grew up in Ferozpur under the guidance and under the shadow of my grandfather and uh, they saw that he again was a very self-made man he had limited resources but what he um, was able to uh, achieve or uh, to um, develop within his uh, limited means and uh, that um, he was hard working he was honest he delivered more than he promised and he saw an opportunity because ferozpur uh, if you uh, will say kind of study w- was one of the larger containments probably the largest containment that the british set up after they took over punjab uh, and uh, they didn't want to be in lahore they wanted to be in ferozpur so that uh, they could keep an eye on the hor from there and they could have a larger con- contingent of british soldiers and um, my grandfather was um, looking after um, you know providing their you know needs uh, food and clothing and anything else that required and generally built up his business um, and it was not a large business but uh, it was um, something that I uh, was recognized even in the containment of Ferozpur that he was a he was a good businessman he also built up resources and he um, uh, brought up these two his, his sons of his to uh, work with him and inculcate in them the spirit of uh, a integrity ethics honesty and hard work i think that was it and uh, he came on a visit to lahore in 1900 and all of a sudden i was seeing some of the papers that uh, we had the opportunity to look at he just died, died all of a sudden without any illness or anything so these um, two um, uh, brothers took the had the responsibility of not only carrying out their business but later on when they decided to move to lahore they set up a shop in as you say in anarkali they call it punjab house not very far from uh, the religious book society that you have just across that uh, the uh, and uh, this is how they grew and and they were known for uh, be, being a reliable purveyor of their needs what the uh, british regiments required and they got uh, contract after contract and these regiments are placed in different stations around india and this is how they moved around and provided this um, service to them and they were able to then um, uh, develop or um, uh, they were able to um, uh, get uh, more affluent uh, and um, they were very austere in their personal habits they didn't smoke they didn't drink they they had married life which was very uh, sort of uh, happy and they were raising a family both my uncle had he had two daughters uh, and uh, my father had a larger brood and uh, so they developed a, a respectability in the in the community and as you said that there weren't too many muslims who were in business uh, the people who were in lahore were prominent were a the feudal lords who had their lands all over punjab or there were uh, people non muslims primarily hindus 
who uh, had uh, gone into um, uh, construction contracting, you know, the Mela Rams and the Ganga Rams of, uh, of this thing. They, the British started building the railways here and some other important buildings and they got the, the Hindus had the, the money and also they had the skill to construct buildings according to the to the plans and the, the specifications of the most of these designs were done by the British. So, so they they were the ones who were prominent in Lahore. And if you, uh, I, when I grew up, it was I was 20 years old at the time of partition. And if you drove from one end of Lahore to the other end of Lahore outside the walled city, there was hardly any building that was owned by a Muslim. It was all owned by Hindus. Sikhs also fell into the same category as the Muslims. They were feudals, you know, inheritors of uh, jagirs uh, given to them by Maharaja, Maharaja Ranjit Singh. There were very few Sikhs who were who were in business. A uh, few uh, doctors uh, and uh, and people like that. I am always curious. So, Sayyid Maratha Bali Sahib, he married Begum Mubarak Sahib, Sayyida Mubarak Sahib, and she came from a very noble family. Uh, very educated family. Uh, her ancestors had served in Maharaja Ranjit Singh's uh, time as Prime Minister, Governor and Foreign Minister too. So how this match of Sayyid Maratha Bali Sahib and... Well, Sahib I mean, it was, I think the credit goes to my grandfather. My father um, was ambitious in the sense that uh, he wanted to improve his, his standing in society. And uh, there was no black spot on him, but uh, he uh, found out that uh, Fakir Iftikharuddin had one daughter who was not married, that was my mother, and he found out, uh, he sought out somebody who knew his father and also knew Fakir Iftikharuddin. So he went to him and he said, uh, would he um, take him to Fakir Iftikharuddin? Uh, you know, uh, with this uh, request that uh, he, that he w he wished to be a part of their family. So my grandfather, who um, in English I don't know the word, but he was very zirak. He could uh, identify individuals. So he saw in my father, uh, you know, something that he that impressed him, and uh, he. Uh, uh, he talked to him, he, uh, you know, discussed with him and then he said, uh, you know, he went inside and he asked my grandmother, his wife, for a ring and a doshala. And he came out and he put the doshala on my father's shoulders and, and the ring. So when later on my grandmother said, why did you, what happened? Why did you want that? He said, I've already found a young man who, uh, had a young body but a very wise old head and I thought he would be make an ideal uh, match for my daughter. It was my grandfather who selected my father. Uh, my father's wish was to be a part of this family and uh, of course neither regretted. Uh, both were very happy and then of course um, my um, grandfather who was well placed in, 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 in government at that time uh, he was in the uh, civil service and then he got into the political service which was the elitist service of the political service of the civil service and uh, they he was uh, put in charge of the visit of the king of afghanistan he came on a visit to to uh, india so my um, grandfather fakir of Sakharuddin had to look after the entourage and uh, he saw that there was an opportunity that he could help his son-in-law to look after the entourage and provide them whatever they required, you know. And they traveled all over India. And my uncle and my father did uh, all the, you know, running around and providing them food and whatever else they needed. And uh, that gave them a, a jump up of their, in their ability to be recognized. And after that, they never looked back. So both uh, Sayyid Maratab Ali Sahib and, and uh, Begum Mubarak Sahib, they both raised a big family. So yeah, you yeah. were like nine kids, yes, your yes. number was eight. Yeah, yeah. Tell us how the environment at home was. 
Well, it was a very, we were a very uh, close family. Not only we, but my uncle's family also lived together. You know, my uncle and his wife and his two daughters. Uh, when I grew up, you know, we lived in a, they built a, you know, one of the first things they did when they had enough of resources to build a house on Rattigan Road, uh, which was just behind Central Model School and very close to Bradlaugh Hall, which was a very important political kind of um, arena for uh, politicians to come and make speeches. So they built a house there, which was large enough to accommodate the, the whole family and this thing. And as uh, we were growing up, my uncle's daughter got married first and then my elder sister got married. Then it was time to, to look beyond that one building. So my father and my uncle who had invested all their surplus um, wealth into properties in Lahore. So they had uh, two houses on Davis Road, which my father, they, we, 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 my father, my, my, my father's family, my mother and the rest of my brothers and uh, we moved to Davis Road and uh, there were two houses, one was 11 Davis Road and the other was nine. So the family spread out in these two houses. And then my uncle built a very uh, large uh, house on Canal, which is now known as Ashana. And um, he, uh, he was much more uh, savvy on getting things done the right way. So he found uh, an architect, uh, I still remember his name, his name was Anderson. He was architect to the government of Punjab and uh, he was allowed to have private practice. So he commissioned him to design his house, Ashyana. And, uh, and he, there was no holds barred. He gave him a free hand. He said, you do what you like. He gave him the number of bedrooms that he required for not only his own family. He was hoping that one day our family will move back to the larger house. But my mother was quite content in living. Every, you know, lady wants a nest of her own. So we lived in Davis Road um, throughout that thing. And my uncle built this house, which was half of it was always empty because he had a small family. But um, so this is how they, they developed and uh, they came into society of Lahore. They were recognized as people who had, you know, their, their business was not connected with anybody here. So they had, they had resources and they never flaunted their, their wealth. They, they had a, they were generous in, in, in entertaining, uh, but uh, never, uh, they were never going and, and getting a, a quid pro quo from people that they en entertained or looked after because their business was totally different to what was available in Lahore, uh, you know, with the civil society. So they, they grew up in a kind of a, 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 a bubble of their own. And this is what happened all the way till 1947. So your father was most of the time traveling. Yeah, yeah, he, he was, was the one. Busy. Because the, you see, as I mentioned earlier on, the, the contract was to a regiment, uh, you know, and when the regiment moved or you got more than one regiment to look after, they at one time per, perhaps six or seven regiments who were spread all over India. And then they also got the contract to look after what they call the transit camps. One was in Karachi and the other was in Bombay, where the arriving regiments would land and before they were posted out, they would sort of get acclimatized. And also these transit camps were used as the departure point of when the regiments were going back to England. So these two transit camps were also under the business, you know, the business of the transit camps were managed by end. This was a very lucrative business. And um, I remember during our summer, uh, the, uh, you know, holidays, Christmas or Rossi, we either went to Bombay, we went to Bombay, we went to, to Karachi. And the Karachi visit was quite, um, uh, you know, I still remember it. I was in Karachi in 1937. We were there in April during Easter holidays when uh, Lama Akbar died. So I still remember going to a memorial service for him 
in Khalik uh, Dina Hall. And my, um, my brother and my father had a stepbrother, so he was looking after this camp. Asar Ali, he was also a poet. He was the only poet in the family. And I still remember that at this particular occasion when they were, you know, making speeches, uh, he uh, came out with this couplet, Iqbal shikwa likhe Islam zinda kar gaya, marne wala mar gaya, Islam zinda kar gaya. So that's, uh, I still recall, this was 1937, I was 11 years old at that time. But the certain things that get stuck in your mind. So I, I was actually going to come to this point. So your mother had uh, interest in literature and history. Yeah. And, you know, in the absence of your father, she was taking care of all these, mashallah, yeah. eight kids, yeah. uh, nine kids. Uh, so. You seem to have a lot of influence from your mother. Indeed, uh, because I, I, I spent more time, you know, with her than my father. Yeah. So, was she the one who made you disciplined? Uh, were you naughty in childhood? No, not very. Not Did very. you used to sneak out from home? No, no, no. no. She was very, uh, she was very possessive in that sense that I was not allowed to go out of the house without being escorted. Right till the end, till I was at. Edson College. I was 17 years old. I used to bicycle and there was a person on a bicycle following me. <laughs> uh, not that they, they wanted, uh, you know, keep an eye on me, but to make sure that if there was any accident or anything like that, they, they, there was somebody there. She uh, was self-educated. You know, she got married in 1904 and um, she was, my grandfather was very keen to educate his daughters, but he had, you know, ustads and malvis coming to the house to to educate them, and and they were very well groomed in both Urdu and 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 Persian primarily. They could also read the Quran, and of course they were all. My mother said her prayers, um, never, you know, I always saw her saying her prayers regularly. So, do you have childhood memories because your mother used to uh, see Alama Iqbal whenever? Alama Iqbal used to visit yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, uh, Alama, Alama. yeah. Alama Iqbal, of course, um, was um, was a very close friend of my Khalu, Fakir Najmuddin, who was married to my uh, elder Khala, eldest Khala, and um, he was Tasildar in Daska. And uh, when the Dr. Iqbal was studying in Murray College in, in Sialkot. So they, the friendship went there. And when Dr. Iqbal uh, decided to move to Lahore uh, and he, he first came and rented a room in Bazar Hakima. Uh, so that's, uh, uh, that was uh, part of his uh, devotion to his friend. And uh, then of course uh, uh, he became prominent and, uh, and, uh, and my khala and my mother didn't observe Parda from Dr. Iqbal. He, when he visited my, my khalu, uh, he would, um, you know, she, they would go and spend time because they knew that spending time with him was learning. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, uh, and she was very, um, you know, she used to read classics, you know, like Tilisam Hosruba and Fasana Azad, which, which was the classic. And I, she told me, I was not, I was probably not born or I was very small, that, um, my father had business in Lucknow because of the regiments and she went with him. She used to travel with him whenever the occasion was available. And when she was in Lucknow, she knew that Ratanath Sarshar, who was the uh, author of uh, Fasana Azad, lived there. And uh, she sought him out and she went and visited him and uh, uh, talked, wanted to meet him. He had grown very old and his, I think his eyesight was failing. And she said that she still wanted to go and meet him because uh, she recognized and, um, and respected his contribution to Urdu literature through that book. And I still remember this for Sana Azad was a big volume, which was always next, lying next to her bed. So she taught you, you know, Urdu, Persian, no, she didn't teach me. But she, she, she but she made, for, you know, uh, when I went to Asian College from Sacred Heart School, the, um, 
the Sacred Heart was all English. Uh, Asian College uh, had Urdu, but it was uh, elementary Urdu, and she and I failed in my first. The only time I ever failed was in Urdu at Jaisen College. And then during summer, when we used to go uh, to the hill stations, uh, uh, we used to go to Mari and then later on to Serinagar. She always made sure that we had a tutor who was proficient in Urdu and, uh, and, and Persian, that he would come with us and uh, spend time uh, uh, talking to us about Urdu literature, about Urdu authors, Urdu poetry. That's how I got interested in Urdu poetry. Yeah, so that's what I wanted to actually say that she was very particular about your education. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Education and, of the and, kids. And not only that, not education, she wanted us to have a very widespread kind of uh, cultural background. My father hated music and she came from a family which loved music. You know, Bazar Hakima was next to the red light district and every uh, uh, male of uh, Fakir Khan family was a patron of that area. And um, I was growing up, I was maybe 17, 18 years old and she knew that I, I had a friend who lived, he was the son of uh, a very good friend of the family, the, uh, Mia Jalaldin. His father was uh, a counselor of the Lahore municipality. They lived in Old Tassil. His grandson was a boy called Aziz, he was my age, we used to play cricket together on Sundays. And she said, why don't you ask Aziz to arrange for a mujra at his house and you go and attend that mujra. Because she knew that that is a part of my learning which would not be available under my father's knowledge. So I would sneak out of the house and uh, in the evening and, and go and, you know, listen to the music. And this was, you know, ghazal and this is how I was got interested in, in classical music. And I still remember the, the person who played tabla was um, was the ustad of of ustad Allah Rakha, whose son Zakir Hussain today is the premier. So he was the the tabla player at that at that concert. Baba Zab, looking at your growth as a human, uh, regardless of the success in in business, but as a human being, you have been mashallah very successful. Uh, I think a lot of credit goes to the early grooming of your mother you know as you said she she wanted you to have a very broad uh, education and then you know the uh, exposure to culture to languages etc coming to the modern times now don't you feel pity at at us as parents the way we are growing our kids you know we are just exposing them to just, we want them to learn English in the schools and you know. No, but I tell you, my father also played a very important role because um, when I, you know, was growing up uh, in, the, in, in the very beginning, I mean, for the summers, we used to go to say, Murray. And um, it so happened that, you know, the, some of the regiments that they had, con they had been contractors for, but we used to have a contingent in, in, in Mari also, a place called Ghadeal, which was a contournement in Kalkuldana. Yeah, yeah. These were contournements which today are under Pakistan Army. So, and we had a canteen there and he would, he would take me along. I was five years old. Uh, and, and later on, I was growing up. Whenever I was at home and it was a holiday, I was not at school. And if he had any visitors to the house, uh, I would be, it would be mandatory for me to sit with him with, and receive the visitors so that I would just listen to them and if he visited anybody he said better chalo mere saath. and it carried on and then the legacy was picked up i mean my even during my father's lifetime my brothers who were the eldest brother sayyid amjad ali was 20 years older than me and sayyid wajad ali he was 15 years older than me whenever they they went out and i was around get into the car come with us they irrespective of whom they wanted to go and see that would take me along, I would just sit there just to expose me to different individuals and these could be important people. I mean, I can tell you, um, uh, I was, uh, I think in the third or fourth year at government college and during vacation, I went gone to Bombay. My brother Vajad, he was based in Bombay. He was looking after the business there. And uh, he had been introduced to Mr. Jinnah. Uh, by my father because Mr. Jinnah was his legal advisor. 
and uh, he's asked me, he said, Jana sahab se mil da? I said, why not? So he called up Mr. Jinnah's secretary and he said, uh, can I come and call her Mr. Jinnah? I have my younger brother here from Lahore, can I bring him along? So he said, sure. So he took me along and I went to Mount Pleasant Road and he was so gracious, he invited us for lunch the next day. So, I mean, this is how they were grooming me. And a similar thing happened, my, I was with my father in Delhi and, uh, and he again wanted to call on Mr. Jinnah who happened to be in Delhi because of the member of the assembly and uh, he said, uh, I'd like to come. He said, come and have lunch. And he said, I have my younger son here. Bring him along. So I had the privilege of having lunch with, with Mr. Jinnah both at his Delhi house, which was 10 Aurangzeb Road and his Bombay house. Uh, so this was, uh, and this is, I mean, it carried on and when and my father was very, um, very keen on, on inviting people to his house for a meal. And from the age of six, it was mandatory for me to sit at the table, whoever was visiting the house. So that I would pick up the manners, I would listen. And, uh, you know, the old saying was that young people have, uh, are to be seen, but not to be heard. Nobody prevented me from talking. They would, you know, the odd word, but I, I had the privilege of being introduced to anybody who came to the house. I was just going to come to the point and you, you brought in Sayyid Amjad Ali Sahab and Sayyid Wajid Ali Sahab. So your family was actually very closely associated with Khayyad Azam. And, yeah, and yeah, my, but particularly Ahmed Sayyid Wajid Ali. Yeah. Sayyid Amjad Ali was the opposite. Yeah, he, he was, was a member of the, unionist. he was a founder member of the Unionist Party. Yeah. He was Secretary General of the Unionist Party when it was formed by Sir Fazli Hussain. Yeah. So he grew up in, in, and he got elected to the Punjab Assembly in 1937 from Zira, Ferozpur, because, because that was our kind of a home district. And uh, he was picked up by Sir Sikandar to be his private parliamentary secretary. And so, so he was sort of sucked into, into the political life. And uh, so all these people came to our house and there I was. I, I had the honor of meeting Sir Sikandar, Ayat, other members of, the, of the, his cabinet and when Sir Sikandar passed away, um, you know, Sir uh, Malik Khazar Hayat. But there was another relationship as Khazar Hayat's son, Nazar. His eldest son was my classmate at Christian College. So uh, that was another relationship. And Sir Sikandar's youngest, uh, one of his younger sons was also at Christian College. So we, and my sisters were very friendly with Sir Sikandar's daughters. So it was a family relationship with them because of schooling. They were at Queen Mary College and I was at Edison College. And Sir Sikandar, you know, sort of recognized me as a member, as an individual, he would not as, as a son of Sayyid Murata Ali, but as an individual. And I remember when his three of his children got married, you know, Shaukat Hayat, Asma Hayat and his daughter Tahira, three of them got married at the same time. Um, and there was tragedy, he died that night when they were married. Uh, and um, he um, he sent me a card in my own name. I, I was maybe 14 years old, so I can never forget the the kindness of these elders. Uh, once Miss Jina, Fatma Jina came to your home as well and your yeah, yeah. younger sister sang a song. Yeah, yeah. Tell us the event because next morning you took your sister yeah, yeah, along yeah, yeah. with yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. My niece, my niece. Yeah, yeah Miss Jina, uh, my, my uh, mother, had a ladies' party for Miss Jinnah. Uh, in those days, you know, you had garden parties, you had tea parties where you, women would come. And of course, there was a, this was the time when there was, a, you know, agitation against Khizar Hayat, you know. And uh, they, the Lahari's had, had made a song based on a, on a Bollywood song. Uh, uh, same tune or something, I don't remember the original song, but I do remember some of the words of this song. They said, Jab tumi chaleng land bajakar band Glancy Pyara. Glancy was the governor here and he retired from here. Jab tumi chaleng land bajakar band Glancy Pyara, council mein kaun hamara. Shotu Ram was a minister in, um, 
in Khazarhaya's cabinet and he died all of a sudden. And say, Ab, Ab Jine ki koi aas nahi, Ab Chotu Ram bhi paas nahi. So it went not like that and um, I was not aware of this party, probably I was at my at Jason College. And the next morning, um, uh, Nawab Amdot, uh, you know, who lived across the road from us, uh, his, uh, he, because his Nawab Amdot's younger brother was at school with me, so we not only knew members of the family, we also knew the servants. And um, his, one of the servants who knew me by the name of, we used to call him Jila, Jalil was his name. He came over to the house and he said, Kal, you know, yesterday evening when Miss Jina was here, some of the ladies of girls of your family sang a song for her. Could Miss Jina wants that young lady to come over? So I, my this was my niece who was living in the house just behind our house. I um, walked across, rush, in fact, ran across, and I, her name is, we call her Manno. Her name is Mavra. Oh, no, Saira. Saira is her name, called her Manno. So I said, Manno, put, you know, get ready. We have been asked to go and see Miss Jinnah. We didn't know it was before Mr. Jinnah. So we walked across and of course we were asked to sit in the drawing room. Miss Jinnah came and he said, Mr. Jinnah will come in a few minutes and he came in. And uh, then she said, uh, can you sing the song that you sang yesterday for me? for Mr. Jinnah. Nobody called him Kaidi Azam, it was Mr. Jinnah. And of course, Mano is very good at, she took off and sang that song. And uh, of course, he understood no word of it. So he put on his monocle and he said, asked me, he said, will you translate what he's singing? <laughs> <laughs> so you translated that. So I, in my, uh, you know, bad translation, I conveyed it to him and he was very pleased. And, uh, you know, I, when we were going to, 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 to Mamdor Villa, I told him, I said, can we find a picture of Ms. Jinnah? So they, Mr. Jinnah, we asked him to sign it. There was nothing in. There was, a, you know, outside Data Sahib, they used to sell these clay kind of things on which you had a transfer picture on it. But it wasn't a pot, but it was a clay, clay dish. So we took it along and he signed it on it. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> no, he was a very human and from that point of view. Yeah. So I, it was a unique uh, experience. So you had an opportunity to, you know, because you were 20s, in 20s when Pakistan uh, became independent. So you had seen that whole movement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and yeah. so I was a very, very strong Muslim leaguer in the family. Yeah. In fact, uh, you know, my brother uh, joined Muslim League just before the election and uh, he was denied the ticket by the Muslim League who said he's, he's a turncoat, he's come from the other side. So, uh, Mia Bashir Ahmed, uh, who was uh, uh, Secretary of the Muslim League in Punjab, you know, of the Shadin family, you know, his, he used to bring out a paper called Humayu, a very, you know, from the very prominent um, Bhagwanpura family. They had a house just outside Lawrence Garden on the on Lawrence Road called Al Manzar. Manzar was his son's name. And uh, so Mia Bashir Ahmed got the ticket from Zira. So I knew his daughters and they called me up. He said, can you come and help us prepare the electoral roll? So I used to go and work with them and my brother knew about it. And my father never forgave me. He said, you went and worked for somebody who was supposed to your own brother. So, but it didn't matter, you know, I mean, we were allowed that freedom that it was a political party, you have your own, uh, your own uh, choice, whoever you wanted to, uh, to support. So, if you compare today, you know, the way Mr. Jinnah conducted himself or uh, Gandhi or Nehru, so which one you think as a politician really conducted him? All three of them were very meticulous. <clears throat> Nobody could pinpoint a single thing on them by way of, of, of either moral turpitude or on financial matters. They were, I mean, Jinnah was the richest of the lot. Uh, Nehru was, uh, he came from wealthy family. He, he didn't earn too much money. And you know, when he died, 
he left only 270,000 rupees in Lloyds Bank in Bombay, in, in Delhi. And these were royalty from his books. That is all what he left. And of course, the house, Anand Bhavan, that was given to the, part, uh, to, to, to the Congress party and became a museum, their house in Allahabad. But they were all, and Gandhi, of course, uh, they, there was a famous saying by Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Naudi, and I do, you know, he always used to travel third class in the railways. They said, you have no idea how expensive it is to keep him poor. Mm -hmm. The party spent money on, on, on Gandhi, but they were, uh, they were very, very upright in their, uh, in their whole. Uh, and uh, I'll give you another uh, very good uh, example. Mind, despite the fact that my brother had a very close relationship with Mr. Jinnah, you know, he used to go to his house whenever he, Jinnah wanted him or whenever my brother wished to call on him. And then after partition, I remember I had come back from America. He wrote a letter to Mr. Jinnah uh, when he was the Governor General. And he said, uh, Sir, I would very much like to hold a, a, a reception in your honor if you could give me the date and the time. And back came a, back came a reply, he said, Wajid, in the position I am today, I'm, 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 I will not be able to come to your house. Wow. And uh, whenever your wife and you would like to call on me, come and have a cup of tea. Me. tea. He wouldn't even have invite him to a dinner. <laughs> <laughs> so he was very meticulous about that. So when uh, Pakistan came into being, you were in America, G -G. you just mentioned, and you witnessed a very historic moment uh, with Sir Zafrullah Khan uh, yeah, at yeah. UN, yeah. Uh, when there was this move for Israel being recognized. Can you... You know, I, you know what happened was, uh, my father who was ever looking for an opportunity to, um, to uh, groom his sons when the first round table conference took place in England in 1931 or 32. My eldest brother, Bhai Amjad, who was the f first graduate of our family, he went to government college, got BS, BA honors, and after that he wanted to further his studies. So he went to England and joined the Middle Temple to become a lawyer. So he was in England. And my father, who knew many of the people who were members of the Muslim delegation, particularly Sir Zufrullah Khan and uh, Sir Muhammad Iqbal and then Sir Shafat Ahmad and Sir Abdul Halim from Calcutta. He wrote to them that my son is in, 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 in London and would, if you need anybody to do any legwork for you to run around, it will not be of any burden to you. He's, he will run around for you on, at his own expense. And uh, because my father thought that this would be a wonderful opportunity for him to learn as to how people are at that level. And, and this is how my father and brother was sort of exposed to. And there, Aga Khan, the senior Aga Khan, was the leader of the Muslim delegation. He didn't know my brother. He spotted him as a young man, well-mannered, well-dressed, always there to serve the Muslim delegation people. He spotted him and he said, you work as my honorary secretary. So whenever, apart from the roundtable conference, whenever Sir Aga Khan came to India, he said, Amjad, you have to be with me the whole time. So this was the time, this is how he was exposed. So I had finished my stay at the University of Michigan and I was ready to come back to Pakistan. And my father told Sir Zofrullah Khan that Babar is in America. If you need anybody to do your running around, he can be available. So I got a letter from Sir Zofrullah Khan say that, you know, you're welcome to be, be a bag carrier in our delegation and, uh, you know, come to New York. So I went to New York, checked in a hotel, paying for my own this thing. And uh, I used to be his bag carrier. In those days, the United Nations was in, you know, the main building came out much later. It was in a place called Lake Success, which was a suburb of New York, where um, they used to have committee meetings. And then the 
plenary meeting where you had everybody in the run hall was in a place called Flushing Meadows. So some meetings were at Flushing Meadows, the others were at, um, at, um, at Lake Success. So I used to be, you know, sitting in, 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 in Sarzofla, Scar, and he was very, very austere. He, everybody in the delegation, they filled up a car. There was no question of one car per person. So he and, um, uh, and um, Ambassador uh, Ispahani, they, they asked me to sit with them and it was a wonderful learning from them. But it was a 45 minute dri drive, they were talking to each other and I was just learning from them. And you know, during these committee meetings, they didn't even have enough people in the delegation to go and sit at that committee room. So there was an occasion from, for a 21 year old person sitting as a delegate in, in a committee. I have some pictures of that, and so it was a wonderful experience. And then, of course, the main, uh, uh, of course, Pakistan became a member of the United Nations. That was big uh, plus for us they, to be recognized as an independent nation. And Sarzofra was the head of it, of our delegation. And then there was this, uh, uh, there was a very strong lobby about recognize Israel as a nation. And the Arabs, uh, you know, decided that the only person who could represent them vociferously and uh, with the right kind of logic was Hazafrullah Khan. So he was there representing not only Pakistan, but the entire Arab world, you know, the King Faisal, and he was a Prince Faisal at that time. He was the foreign minister, he was there. And they were, of course, uh, the, uh, the president of uh, Lebanon, Sir Amil Shamoon, he was a Maronite or somebody, and there was somebody from Iraq. So all these people were there and they were sort of, uh, you, you know, running around Shalzofla Khan to, to plead their case. And it was wonderful to see that. And uh, of course, uh, the Israel lobby was very strong. The Americans were with them. And of course, America had such a clout at that time. The entire South American people were also with them. Uh, the British were with them, all these people that they had helped during the war. And I remember, uh, you know, the Turks were there. Uh, Turks were not a part of the Arab group. So I suggested to Sir Zofla Khan, I said, why don't you ask Turks to be with in your list? So, you know, blunt as he was, he said, the Turks, even, their, even in their dreams, would not vote against America. The, the Turks were totally in the pocket of the Americans at that time. So this was a wonderful experience. And then one of the very um, kind of things that uh, I still remember was they got hold of, who was the first president of Israel? Um, Weizmann? Weizmann. Yeah. He, he was almost blind. And I was sitting not very far from him when he made his presentation to the to the number one committee, which was the political committee, and the 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 speech that they had brought for him was in very bold letters. Even then, he had to read it through a magnifying glass. He was that blind. But just to bring his, you know, he was well respected, Weizmann, as as a I think he was a scientist. Yeah, he, there's a very famous institute in okay. Israel, Institute of So Weizmann. he was brought in as, uh, as, as, as a kind of a symbol of leadership of Israel, the most eldest and respected person. So I saw him and not very far. No, it was a wonderful experience. There was, uh, Vyshinsky was there as the foreign minister of, uh, of uh, Soviet Union and Madam um, Vijaya Lakshmi Pandit, who was the elder sister of Pandit Nehru, she represented India. And so Zafrullah was popular with everybody. You know, I mean, uh, I remember he's walking up to Mrs. Pandit and complaining to him that, you know, you have treated the Kadianis and Kadian very badly. Yeah, you know, and she said, I'll send a message home and all that kind of thing. He was, he was very blunt and open. So this was a wonderful experience. I was there for six weeks. At the, at the United Nations. And then later on, I had the opportunity to 
uh, to go to the United Nations uh, for a number of years. I was I was uh, invited to be a member of uh, of a committee that uh, would uh, would prepare the code of conduct for the multinationals. You know when they had this. Uh, this coup in Chile and Allende was thrown out by American influence and they brought in uh, another general to hand that country and the Russians and the Eastern Bloc said that this was a coup because they, the Americans wanted the copper from Chile. So then they put up this committee to, uh, to, de de to develop a code of conduct as to how the multinationals who would be, they were called the transnationals who would be uh, doing business beyond their mother country, would would be conducting themselves and behave themselves so that they do not interfere with the governments. I was serving on that committee for about six years. So this was a very, very good experience at the UN. Professor, coming back to the creation of Pakistan, so uh, you have shared with us it, it was a very meticulous team. Even you know people who were associated with that team, like your elder brothers, you you were never charging anything. You were traveling at your own expense, and Jinnah was not even accepting uh, invitation. So from that till today, what do you think? Where things have gone wrong with such a wonderful team, such a wonderful foundation? There were several um, uh, you know shocks to the system. What was uh, Qaidi Azam himself lived only a year after Pakistan was created. And of the year that he lived, half the time, was, three quarters of the time he was sick. So, uh, and, but Liaquat Ali Khan, who was the Prime Minister and his, you know, very loyal and a very capable lieutenant, he carried the ball well. Uh, he was honest, he was hardworking, he was. Uh, he was a true politician, he was a leader, he could take decisions. And uh, so then, uh, you know, and, and we inherited a, a group of very dedicated civil servants who came across from India, you know, all over India, from Madras, from, Bom from Bengal, from Bihar, from UP, from Bombay, people who, you know, these civil servants, ICS, uh, and people who had uh, served in the police uh, uh, and also in the judiciary, uh, many of them decided to to come to Pakistan because they wanted to serve Pakistan. Uh, they they were all very dedicated people, uh, and uh, but then then there were some sort of black sheep in the sense uh, who um, were not very uh, ethical in the distribution of. Uh, Evacue property, and that is where I think the first uh, uh, bad germs came into the system. Uh, you know, they, they, there was a regular interaction between governments of India and Pakistan on exchange of property and issues that were not totally resolved at the time of independence. And one was particularly on what the the Indians had left behind. Uh, non-Muslims had left behind and what the Muslims had. And the Indians came up with this idea, let's exchange data and uh, documents on property that Muslims have left in India uh, who migrated here and the Hindus who migrated there. Uh, we were not prepared to do that because everybody was exaggerating his claim. And that is, I think, the first step towards bringing in bad germs into our our whole body of uh, of our uh, economic uh, development. That was one. Uh, the other was uh, uh, when Liaquat Ali Khan passed away, uh, there was a lot of uh, maneuvering by some of the senior bureaucrats who by this time uh, realized that the politicians uh, who were in power at that time could be manipulated. Uh, Khaja Nasmuddin was a thorough gentleman and Mr. Ghulam Muhammad, who was a civil servant to start with but uh, became Governor General. Uh, he uh, uh, became more 
uh, autocratic. And then you had some senior bureaucrats like uh, Sekandar Mirza, who again uh, sensed the weaknesses of the of the politician. Weaknesses not in, as far as morality is concerned, weaknesses as far as thinking is concerned. So they started manipulating and which ultimately ended up in uh, Ayub Khan's martial law, which Sekandar Mirza and he had uh, had uh, had maneuvered. Uh, and, and there, uh, that was, I think, the start of the rot, a big rot at that time. And ever since then, we've been downhill. Uh, and then, of course, uh, unfair treatment to Bangladesh, East Pakistan. They generated a lot of foreign exchange resources through export of jute. Uh, and, uh, and, and they were they were watching it and they said, uh, you know, we are spending all this money in developing West Pakistan, uh, developing the army. We said, if Pakistan, West Pakistan is strong, nobody will be able to, to look at you. We'll be, defend you from here. And uh, whereas the army built it up, but economically, there was no, uh, there were very few industries in East Pakistan. There was very little generation of new capital. Infrastructure was not developed. So they, they, they there was a, sort of a growing unhappiness in East Pakistan, which ultimately culminated in the separation of that country. And we are totally responsible for that. One is the the army and, uh, and of course, uh, emergence of Mr. Bhutto. Uh, he, again, was uh, very ambitious, uh, very well educated, very clever, but uh, uh, the more power he got, the, the more intoxicated he was with that power. He um, and, and ultimately it ended up uh, in his own elimination. So it was a very sad saga. Uh, we uh, nobody has destroyed uh, us or hurt us more than we ourselves. Of course, India was not friendly with us, but uh, we ourselves have been main architects of our own uh, of our own uh, uh, condition where we are today along the same lines so i learned you in your personal capacity and even your family has served pretty much along all the people no, we, because we, we had you know our uh, business uh, was trading yeah and at uh, the very beginning the government was very keen and very, very prompted us to be more proactive because there were very few people who had money. They, they asked us to go and set up an office in Bombay to back, bring textiles into, into Punjab and Frontier. There was an Indian business and Muslim by the name of Mr. Fakhruddin Walika. He was given the right to bring in cloth for Sindh. But we were asked to bring it for Punjab and for Frontier. He was bringing for Sindh and Baluchistan. Professor, you have worked with Bhutto, with uh, Zia, with uh, Musharraf, Nawaz Sharif, Benazir. You sacrificed your own time to go and serve the country. Did you find anyone interested in the future of this country? I think Bhutto was it to start with. Because he sort of um, thought that he wanted to immortalize himself. And in doing that, he thought that the, the country should also progress. So he was very keen. Uh, but uh, then he went off the rails. He thought he was bigger than the country. And that is what brought his downfall. Uh, Zaul Haq uh, uh, was totally uh, a munafik. I mean, he, in the sense that he didn't believe what he said. He was the son of a mullah and he wanted this country to be downgraded to the level of a, of a village mosque. Uh, there was no, no, no intellect about him. Uh, he was out to uh, cheat everybody, uh, you know, on this. I mean, making the bomb was also a big, you know, cheating the whole world on that. Um, so, um, so Benazir, of course, was thrown into prominence, not for any personal ability, because she carried that name. 
uh, she was she had to surround herself by people who made her bigger than life and of course they had their own agenda uh, musharraf uh, again uh, pompous commando uh, thought that he could solve every problem uh, he he had nothing uh, you know no nobody is really interested in the future of the country they were really interested in how big they could be themselves uh, musharraf was financially not honest but by this time the army had become so generous by, for rewarding their red tape that they didn't have to be dishonest they got plots in every dha uh, which gave them a lot of money uh, they were well dept after the homes that they lived in were furnished by the army manned by the army so this was a part of their their uh, perks so the army maneuvered that <clears throat> they would be treated like royalty they had this what they call the civil list where the country had to bear the cost of of their total living they never lived within their salary or anything like that so uh, despite you know uh, your reluctance to join musharraf every time you you went and you know in whatever capacity you you help the government what stands out very clearly is that you know there are so many business families in this country pakistan has given so much to all big big business tycoons no one has really served the way you and your family is trying to pay back to this country whether it is education whether it is you know any field uh and we never heard any scandal about you know maratha bali or babar ali uh, well i tell you one is that we by the grace of god we had enough resources at the time of partition so the idea of becoming richer was never in our uh, never in uh, on in our agenda we were uh, we wanted to grow we have grown uh, through hard work through ideas through uh, industry to bringing new ideas but there was no intention that we should get something for nothing um so that is something that uh, we have been very meticulous the other thing is that uh, we always fought for our right as a as a business family or as business industrial family or as a citizen we didn't want any special favors uh, which one has seen and learnt about with many of the people who have gone into prominence in business they they asked for special uh treatment we we never asked for it the only time i went to government and asked for any any special favor was to get a charter for lums uh, and nothing else we had a transaction with them that all right we'll do this for you you do this for us i mean and, and that was also in the interest of the country we had uh, to give you an example we had a number of uh, property plots around walton airport and um, i suggested to my father i said we can't take care of these why don't we go to government and ask them to consolidate these plots into one large plot and we will donate it we'll set up a a, a trust and we'll donate it to the trust and the trust will set up a technical institute and we went to the government to the uh, to this additional secretary development uh, um sheikh ikramul haq was the secretary and i uh, we went and he said uh, shah saab this is uh, this is a fantastic idea he said uh, it was their martial law in those days and akhtar hussain saab was the governor of punjab he said i'll take to the governor and within a week i got a letter from sheikh akramul haq that the governor has approved you go to lda and with your documents and you prove to them that you have the ownership of this property and we'll consolidate it for you they did it we donated to the trust and this is where really institute today is so two last questions i have baba sir so besides a uh, very good grooming and and you know uh, tarbiyat at home uh, one thing uh, you always remember your teachers uh, with great gratitude and reverence uh, in particular the teachers at hsn 
so what do you think what is the role of teacher in making a human successful in the long run i tell you i mean after the parents they they have the the maximum uh, uh, role to play and we were very lucky see when i was at in college, college i was 84th on the roll so there were very few and we had almost uh, a teacher for every 10 boys and these teachers were not there for for their academic excellence they were there as tutors somebody who would watch the upbringing of uh, of these youngsters that they become good citizens they would become uh, well mannered and 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 i treated my teachers as my as a father and gave them the same respect uh, even the english one that we always used to you know sort of uh, respect them with i remember um, mr barry who was the principal uh, he left etchen college in 1946 before partition and of course i had had left etchen college in 43 and i reunited with him about 40 years later when he had retired he had gone into the education system in in england he was he became inspector of schools in manchester area and then later on and i sought him out and uh, because i was thinking of setting up this teacher training institute at ali institute and i thought i'd seek out his advice as to how to go about it and i wrote to him i said i'm coming can you come yeah and he came, came, you know he traveled to london to be, and he brought the current inspector of schools he said i'm out of date and i used to you know i was referring to barry as i was serving him all the time and he turned out to his he said i taught him 40 years ago and he still serves me this is a this was from heart it was not a put up show because and we respected and uh, the other teachers that we had half of them were non muslims we gave them the same respect whenever i went to india whoever was alive he um, i went to went to pay my respects to him and uh, one of my teachers um, who knew my interest in persian and he was a persian teacher himself rehwan and kashyap he was a caste uh, pandit he um, came to uh, he used to come to pakistan um, now and then and on his last visit he brought the persian urdu dictionary is uh, this was steen gauss is a very standard dictionary of uh, a persian english one and he said i i brought it from my library because there is nobody in india who would value it and i brought i want to to give it to you and it's one of my cherished possessions here so uh, this was a wonderful relationship and i think i benefited a lot from that one last question about your your academia so you uh, very boldly write that it took you decades to come out, out of the complex which was you know uh somehow due to the uh, deliberate attempt to educate you in british history and and the western culture and you you write very honestly that it took me decades to come out of that complex so tell me two things one uh, what that complex was and second uh, don't you think in the present times we are again unknowingly educating our kids we are throwing them back into that complex by blindly following you know this westernization of our, our you know i mean uh, i can tell you uh, if, if i took o, o, uh, the equivalent of o and a level it was senior cambridge and har school certificate these were cambridge examination and the history that we were taught was not the history of india we were taught the history of of for instance the colonization of america by the british you know the caribbean and all that and one did not know uh or you know we, it was written by the british all the good things they brought to north america and about the good things they did to india they had totally blanketed how they they captured india and how they rooted india so subsequent to the, you know my going through the academic uh, learning uh, i maintained you know i got to know dr nazir ahmed who was principal at some of the government college and when he retired from there i requested him to come and spend time at at with me at 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 packages and he worked on these punjabi poets and he was a very close friend of victor kernan who was also my teacher at chen college and victor kernan was a card carrying 
Later on, we found out was a card-carrying communist, member of the Communist Party. And uh, I, you know, maintained contact with him ever. He went, he was a fellow at Trinity College in, at Cambridge. But when they found out his leftist leanings after the war, they wanted to let him come to Cambridge. But Edinburgh let him be there and he retired as Professor Emeritus of History. And Kernan wrote a lot of material on the, of the exploitation by the British, not only of India, but of China and all that. And that opened my eyes to see, uh, the, you know, it sort of unfrocked the British. Uh, you know, we look to them as givers of knowledge and center of all the good things that had happened in this world. But uh, it, it, the more you study, the, the more unhappy you are how the British had totally uh, destroyed us. You know, there were more people percentage-wise literate in India when the British came than when they left after 200 years. The total literacy was 14 percent, one four, when the British left. This is new to me. So it's a, it's a quite an eye-opener. Whereas India has marched forward in educating their people, they allocated much larger resources to education. And we found that education was not that important. And that's we are paying for it. Well, so while reading your autobiography, Learning from Others, uh, the only time I, I laughed really hilariously was when I learned that your wife, uh, Sayyida Paveen Sahib, she refused to marry you. So what was that? Well, there she is sitting here. Uh, she uh, thought that I was too much of a playboy and uh, and I was uh, not ready to settle down and uh, denounced me. And uh, I had time to reflect and I said, uh, if I have to settle down, I should get married to somebody who uh, would make a good home, uh, who would be uh, very much acceptable to my family and who would be a good mother to my children. So I made this decision. I said, I want to marry you. And she, meanwhile, uh, she had uh, walked out. She, but she was a first cousin, so she went to America. My brother invited her over that you come over and see America. And um, uh, another uh, niece of mine who was her best friend, I went to her and I said, uh, will you help me uh, uh, make up with her? And she said, well, she said, she thought I'd make a good match. So she said she'll write to her. And of course, she wrote to her and back came the reply, never. And then she said, you know, said, think it over. And then, I don't know, she changed her mind and she said, all right, I forgive him. And uh, so this news spread in my family. They said, don't take a chance, put him on the plane and let him go to America <laughs> before she changes her mind again. And meanwhile, my brother, who was the ambassador there, well, played a very important role in sort of keeping her happy. And the date was fixed. Uh, uh, for the marriage, it was 8th of July, 1955. So I arrived in America on the 1st of July and arrived in Washington on the 7th of July. And he had, um, he didn't want people to, to give him, give any presents. So he issued cards as a surprise party. Uh, and he, because he had been in America for a number of years, he was among the very popular uh, people in the diplomatic diplomatic corps and also among the other important Americans. So he uh, he, uh, he knew Vice President Nixon. So uh, Nixon's office called up. She said, "What is the surprise party?" So he shared with them. They said, "My brother is getting married, but this is not to be talked to anybody else." So he decided. He said he and his wife would die, come. So that was how we went and. Uh, have lived happily ever after. So, <laughs> I'm a scientist, so I'm going to end this conversation on a hypothetical question. So, scientists always make a hypothesis. So, do you think, uh, had she been, so your wife, had she been a working woman, you would have been as successful? Well, in those days, there weren't too many work, uh, working women. She had already done her BA and uh, she was destined to be a housewife. 
so it was unthinkable in our family to to be a, a working woman at 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 that time there was nobody there was no there was no precedence but you think dedicated housewife yeah yeah of course uh, i've never worried about it's what to eat and how the house is <laughs> being furnished and she played the major role in the building of this house with the working with the architect and the garden is you know this was totally a desolate place so what you see in the garden is all her work and by my good health you see she has looked after me well and she has fed me well yeah thank you very much baba sir it was such a pleasure how should one develop a good personal vision in life i think the compelling factor should be how can be you be more useful to others not that you should be like a peacock strutting with all your feathers out that's the last thing anybody should do because such peacock peacocks get shot very quickly <laughs> <laughs>